The final chapter of Concepts of Biology is chapter 21, Conservation and Biodiversity. It's a relatively short chapter. It touches on the importance of biodiversity, the threats to it, and how we can go about preserving it. Biodiversity is an incredibly important thing to protect. Habitat destruction through deforestation, especially of our rainforests, as you can see here of this image of Brazil, is one of the current causes uh, in the major kind of biodiversity, but we see that there are actually a lot of other things happening on our planet that are threatening it as well. So biodiversity essentially is a broad term for biological variety. We look at both the number of species and the number of individuals in those species. If you have 100 species, but you've only got two individuals of each kind, you have a really threatened area. We're also starting to look at the diversity of genes, populations, and ecosystems as well, because if you have 30 cheetahs, but all the cheetahs are of the same family, they're going to quickly become inbred, and you're gonna see a lot of breakdown and a lot of ill health in those members of the cheetah family that you have left. The loss of a particular individual species, with certain exceptions, think about keystone or foundational species, might actually seem unimportant. But what we find is happening is that there's an accelerated rate of extinction. So while one species might go extinct today, there's a really good chance that tens of thousands will go extinct within our lifetimes, and that is a huge deal. Yes, a lot of it is occurring in tropical regions, but it's happening here at home too. Human populations, we're embedded within our ecosystem and we're dependent on them, just like every other species on the planet. So we need to stop destroying them. Our ecosystems provide us with food and medication, clean water and clean air, and it's really important that we recognize that. The, the lowland tropical rainforest as seen here is an example of a really high biodiversity habitat. This particular location is protected within a national forest, but only about 10% of the original coastal lowland forest remains which means that we've already lost half of the naturally occurring biodiversity in this region. So we're making gains, but it seems like we're, we're losing more than we're gaining. It's definitely two steps back and one step forward rather than the other way around. I mentioned some different types of biodiversity and we're gonna touch on those again just to make sure we're all on the same page. Genetic diversity references different types of raw materials for adaptation in a species. Chemical diversity is comes from kind of the idea that species have different genetic makeups that allow them to produce different assortments of chemicals in their cells. Some members of a species might make more than a, you know might make more of a particular protein or more of a particular hormone. And it turns out that some of these are incredibly important. In fact, we can actually derive a medication from rattlesnake venom and use that medication to prevent heart attacks in people with very specific heart conditions. Some rattlesnakes produce more of that particular protein than others, even members of the exact same species. So we see chemical diversity within a group. Ecosystem diversity references the number of different ecosystems on Earth or the number of different ecosystems in kind of a given geological area. Whole ecosystems are disappearing in some cases. In certain situations, certain members of that ecosystem, certain species that live there can move out and go to other places and adapt, but that's really not always the case. When we look at current species and current species diversity, a recent estimate suggests that eukaryotic species that we've gone about naming, um, about 1.5 million of them, accounts for less than 20% of the total number of species found on our planet. So we might be losing certain groups and we don't even know it yet because we haven't given them a name. Here's uh, this chart is really, or not chart, um, excuse me, this spreadsheet is really great. Uh, it shows you the estimated numbers of described and predicted species and it shows you kind of the differences so you can see the numbers of animals, photosynthetic protists, fungi, plants, non-photosynthetic protists, prokaryotes, and then look at the total number of species as, as we go. So we're describing species at a, I mean, a relatively decent rate, but we find um, that we're just not catching up to what we predict is there, which is good. There are more things, more things to discover, but still. 
There are particular patterns that you can look for as we discussed biodiversity because it's not evenly distributed among the planet. For example, we can discuss endemic species. Endemic species are only found in one location. Blue jays only exist here in North America. Endemic species tend to be highly restricted in their distribution, which means that they're really vulnerable to extinction. If you have polar bears and they only live in one area of the, you know, one region of the planet, if you destroy that region, polar bears don't have anywhere else to go. There are two factors, latitude and age, that seem to explain the general biodiversity patterns we see on Earth. And that pattern that's generalized is that biodiversity increases as you get closer to the equator. And there are a few reasons for that. And it's largely that idea of latitude and age. Because when you get closer to the ecosystem, you have a lot less variability in your, in your season. So there are a lot more organisms that can live in that area because you don't have to worry about migrating in and out or part of the year where you don't have energy. But they also have a greater amount of energy overall because they get more sunlight. They have more sunlight filled days and longer sunlight filled days, which means their plants can build up a stronger kind of more heftier base of the food chain, which allows for more and more individuals to live in that area. The complexity of tropical ecosystems might actually promote speciation by increasing something called habitat heterogeneity. And that's the number of ecological niches. So the more stuff you have in a region, in an area, in a forest, in a wherever, the more niches or little hiding spots or little areas for other animals to exist. The easiest way to think about this is if you lose your keys in a house that is immaculate, perfectly clean, not a whole lot in it, nothing on the countertop, it's probably not going to take you very long to hide your keys because there's only so many places they can hide because there's just not a lot there. However, if you lose your house or you lose your keys in your grandma's house, maybe your grandma is a hoarder, there are a lot of places that your keys could potentially be hiding because there's little nooks and crannies absolutely everywhere. In areas where you have more species, there's lots of nooks and crannies and little specialized areas everywhere. And therefore, when you already have more species, it's easier to even get more. And it's kind of that snowball effect. As we study the different distributions of species across the planet. It is a little bit different depending on who we're talking about. We'll go back to our example of polar bears. Animals that need really, really, really cold weather, ice caps, ice flows, things of that nature, are obviously going to be found in very particular parts of the planet and not seen in other parts of the planet. So the species maps, biodiversity maps, can look a whole lot different depending on what the map is actually depicting. When it comes down to the importance of biodiversity, we can look at three major categories. Biodiversity affects human health, agriculture, and wild food resources. And this is from a completely kind of selfish output because all three of these are about human beings. When it comes to human health, biodiversity is important because most of our medicines come from various plants. And had we cut down these plants before we had the opportunity to truly study them, we might not have found their uses. We might not have been able to do something like create a drug that treats lymphoma. Biodiversity is incredibly important when it comes to uh, agriculture. If everything that we have, if we're only ever eating one crop and that whole crop is identical, well, what happens if a fungus develops that makes that crop sick? Or uh, there's a protist that comes in and infects it and, and makes it you know, no longer edible? we've just lost our one food source. So we do a lot to try to protect the diversity of crops, especially food crops. And we have things like the global seed vault as seen here, which holds seeds in this protected space to keep them away from outsiders and any potential influences in case, um, you know, God forbid something ever happened to our plant diversity as we know it now, we would have these older seeds to come back to and hopefully kind of repopulate the planet with plants that we're already familiar with. And that kind of leads us to our third 
thing that we're worried about wild food resources we still have a lot of food that we catch in the wild even though we might not realize it you know ocean fishing crab fishing um, there's a lot of food that we're getting from our environments and there are some communities that are largely dependent still on foraging or harvesting natural resources to feed themselves and to protect their families so the importance of biodiversity touches every single human even if you don't necessarily realize it there are unfortunately a lot of threats to biodiversity habitat loss over harvesting over harvesting exotic species can be dangerous and of course the big one is climate change habitat loss is a huge concern in this image, you can see an oil palm plantation that replaced native forest habitat. And a whole lot of species dependent on that native forest habitat. They can't live in this area anymore. All of their homes are gone. These plants might not be as effective photosynthesizers as the plants that used to live there. So they're not capturing carbon from our, ox from our environment anymore. They're not producing nearly as much oxygen for us anymore. And these plants are no longer providing homes for some of the animals that were really important in the local food chain. So I mean, I can only imagine how many species probably died out when they clean cut this forest in order to plant these palms. Another issue that people don't always think about are exotic species. When an exotic species is introduced to a new location and it didn't belong there, usually it's not going to have a predator. So an example is this brown tree snake that was introduced to the island of Guam. And it's eating all these, these birds that didn't used to have to try to avoid the tree snake. And it's eating some smaller mammals. And because nothing is eating this tree snake, there isn't, it doesn't fit in the food web because it's not supposed to be there. They're just eating and eating and eating and increasing in numbers. And this snake is responsible for causing numerous extinctions on the island of Guam. And they've been trying to deal with that since the 1950s and it's still a big problem. Another example um, is kind of smaller, on a smaller scale. So there are some funguses like this um, Cytridomycosis that was introduced to Panama and it is infecting frogs that's infect, infecting uh, different amphibians on the island of Panama and they don't have any natural defenses towards it. They don't know how to you know avoid if infected areas. They don't know how to avoid reproductive structures. They don't recognize it on members of their colony because they've never had to deal with this before. So it's an exotic species that was introduced to Panama that's causing um, mass die-off of the species that it infects. This little guy, this little bat has white nose syndrome and it too was introduced into caves um, where it didn't used to be. It's an exotic species and what it does essentially is it causes these bats to wake up when they should be hibernating. They burn through all of their energy and they die of starvation. And there are whole bat colonies. We're talking like tens of thousands of bats that are dying of this white nose issue. And because the bats are dying, they're not eating the dangerous bugs in the environment. So there's far too many, excuse me, sorry. There's far too many bugs. There's more mosquitoes, there's more ticks. Um, there's more like uh, biting flies, things that the bats normally help us to take care of. They're all gone because the bats are dying of this white nose syndrome. There are some kind of really scary examples of what's going on with global warming here. Uh, are some of the, one of like the more famous pictures, the effect of global warming can be seen in the continuing retreat of Gunnell Glacier. The mean annual temperature of Glacier National Park has increased 1.33 degrees Celsius since 1900. The loss of the glaciers, um, the loss of the glaciers results in the loss of summer meltwaters. So, <clears throat> So we're seeing a lot of really severe impacts on local ecosystems. The glacier itself supports its own environment, but then the water that traditionally runs off of the glacier and feeds these smaller ecosystems is having its own impact. And this is because of increases in global temperatures. Some people try to argue if it's happening or why it's happening, but the fact is it's happening and we are one of the major drivers of the increase of global temperature because we're pumping so much CO2 into our environment. It's enveloping our planet like a blanket. Think about a, a puffy ski jacket that traps hot air next to you, it warms you up. 
CO2 is like putting a puffy ski jacket on the planet, trapping hot air, dropping hot UV rays and warming us up. We can see that atmospheric carbon dioxide levels have always fluctuated in a cyclical manner, but the burning of fossil fuels in recent history has caused a ridiculous increase in the number or the levels of carbon dioxide in Earth's atmosphere. They have reached levels that we've never seen before on planet Earth. And the addition of other greenhouse gases is making our temperature rise at rates we've never seen because animals can't evolve fast enough. Our global food chain is going to collapse unless we do something about it. When it comes to preserving biodiversity, we need to realize kind of a, a chunk of things. One, yes, changes are natural. They're going to happen over time. However, when we consider the recent and current extinction rate, we see that the changes are happening way too quickly and eventually we're gonna kind of hit that tipping point. We can't go backwards anymore. We do have better ways to estimate present day extinction rates. And as we see them, we focus on conservation biology. How can we change human behavior? How can we increase the conservation that happens in preserves? How can we restore habitats? And what can we do as human beings to help species come back? Extinction intensity is reflected in our fossil record and it's gone up and down over the course of history. The issue is, is that we might be in the no we might be in the mix, we might be in the middle of another mass extinction. You can see five of them here where the vast majority of species on planet Earth have died off all in one fell swoop. The issue is, is that at the end of every other mass extinction, there wasn't a cognizant thinking human population that is going to undergo a massive collapse. Yes, it was awful when all these other previous extinctions happened, but humans weren't around to have a civilization that was going to collapse. And civilization will collapse if we go through another mass extinction because we're not going to be able to feed the vast majority of people on our planet. And when you run out of food, you can kind of guess what happens next. We have pushed certain species to extinction ourselves. The dodo bird was hunted into extinction in about 1660. We've seen a lot of other examples of things being hunted or outcompeted into extinction and those rates seem to be increasing. We found that as you deforest areas, kind of the larger area you deforest, the more species get affected. So you can see kind of the sideways J curve where the greater a forested area is, the number of species it can support. So we have a lot of these smaller reserves and we're trying to do really great things. We're protecting these new areas. But the issue is for kind of true large scale protection of biodiversity, you need these massive forests and these really entangled ecosystems because they are the most resilient. They are the most resistant to ecological disturbances. We are doing really great things. This picture is uh, Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, and it's a huge park, and it's making excellent strides to conserve biodiversity. But until we start increasing these regions, we, uh, we're not gonna see the gains that we would like to see. In this map, you can see where Conservation International has identified 34 biodiversity hotspots. Hot Although these cover only 1.2% of Earth's surface, 42% of terrestrial vertebrate species, and 50% of the world's plants are endemic to these hotspots. So even if we could just focus on these particular biodiversity hotspots, these areas that have been either protected because of their geography or the politics of the region for extended periods of time, they hold the majority of our species. So we can, if we could just protect them, then maybe we'll be okay. Maybe we can keep those regions rich and healthy and we can continue researching for medicine's sake. We can continue capturing carbon in these plants. We can continue um, looking for new foods that can be cultivated elsewhere. It's important though that we protect these places because they affect the health of the planet everywhere else. 
This photograph shows you a given wolf pack in National and Yellowstone National Park. The wolves have been identified as a keystone species. So even if we can't protect an entire biological hotspot, maybe we need to be really careful about what species we are protecting in other locations. If you know that something is a keystone species, you know that something is a foundational species. If you don't have the money or the resources to protect everything, focus on those keystones because they will keep everything else in check. But once, as you have we learned, once you remove the keystone pieces, you know, the rest of your archway, everything else that you have, it tumbles to the ground. So if we can't think big picture, at least we can think smaller picture in certain areas. Wonderfully, thankfully, we do have some great zoos out there and captive breeding programs that are helping to preserve endangered species. If you're going to visit a zoo, make sure that it's an accredited zoo. That means they're not capturing animals out of the wild for your pleasure, but instead they are rehabilitating animals and trying to um, responsibly bring back biodiversity to our planet to ensure that we, we can enjoy these animals, but then future generations can enjoy these animals and hopefully once their habitats are restored they can be returned to the ecosystem in which they rightfully belong and own as animals themselves on that very passionate note you should read this chapter it's really wonderful take notes in your own words consider external resources and then attempt your homework which hopefully Whoever you are that's watching this is probably your last homework assignment as chapter 21, Conservation and Biodiversity is the very last chapter in Concepts of Biology.